indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, all, and welcome to the October 21st meeting of the Cape Cod County Commissioners. It's 12 p.m. on Wednesday, and um, we know that Jill will be alone, but we want to get the meeting started and get it underway. And I think under public comment, uh, Jackie Fields, you would like to, uh, uh, you have something to say. So Thank please, you. very much. Um, it's with great pleasure that uh, the Barnesville County Human Rights Commission is uh, fortunate enough to introduce to you the uh, new uh, coordinator for our organization, and her name is Elizabeth Dolby. And I'd like for you to meet her right. and to know her. And many of you, we see each other at various and different similar meetings. So we'll be doing this tomorrow, uh, <laughs> the Health and Human Services meeting. And uh, for you all to know that Liz has joined us. We um, were fortunate to have Mary Lohan with us for two years, and then she and her family uh, moved back to Ireland. And so Liz has joined us. Yeah, Mary, Mary Lohan. No, but her husband. Her mom, yes, right? the whole family uh, went back to Ireland. Uh, Mark is... Um, a student, and well, he, he is a lawyer, but he's in law school uh, studying for the uh, bar. Mm -hmm. And so Mary came back and packed up the house in August. And uh, so we were fortunate to have Liz join us. Mm -hmm. I want you to know her. Yeah. Well, good. Well, Liz, welcome. We're happy to have you. And thank you for uh, bringing her and introducing me to and, you. And you know that um, her office is at Federated Church on the second floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Jordy, you did ask me to um, share with you some information about the immigrant celebration. So I put together three packets for uh, you and the commissioners, some news clippings, the list of the events, and um, we were fortunate enough to have uh, wonderful books uh, donated to us by um, Boston City Hospital. I don't think they use that name anymore. But uh, about healthy families and healthy Boston eating. Boston Thank you, Boston Medical Center. <laughs> and uh, they heard about our work. Yes, and uh, so they gave us these things. But I'll leave these with you now. And uh, thank you for letting me introduce this. Thanks, Jack. Okay. Mm -hmm. for them. Thank you. Yes, that's for them. And I think probably on a future agenda, we might, may want to take up the issue of um, the immigrants. You know, I had an interesting experience about a month ago. John Muller from uh, Webner, Albert and Falmouth, uh -huh. uh, taught a leadership course to immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, there were probably 15 or 18 in her class, and she asked me to come and speak about, the about, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, about right. government. Yes, wonderful. And they were from all different countries, mm -hmm. and I was just amazed at their enthusiasm, at their... Uh, at their willingness and, and uh, excitement about understanding local government and state government and how they can contribute to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I realized what happened the other day with the meeting, please have a seat, where um, uh, there wasn't a, a terrific showing, it was so different from the group that I had met with. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to get back in touch with Joan and ask her how we might get that group more involved in uh, in helping uh, the county address mm -hmm. some of those issues. And I think many of those members were from the Immigrant Center. And Steve Brown is very much acquainted with that. Mm -hmm. And they had their annual meeting there at Phil Coy. And uh, you'll notice that one of the um, immigrant events uh, in July was uh, hosted there. So uh, it's, it's a great place. Good connection. Yes. Uh, hi, Sheila. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Welcome, Liz. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome, Liz. Uh, we're scooting off to another meeting. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's great to meet everyone. Nice to meet nice you, too, Liz. We can proceed to the yes, next please. item on our agenda, which is yes. an update on the Children, Youth, and Family programs. And we have uh, quite a, a number of representatives today to be with us. Good morning. I mean, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having us here today. Um, I'm Kristen O'Malley. I work for the Cape Cod Foundation, but I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of the council for this year. And I have a number of colleagues here all spread out, and they're going to introduce themselves. So we just wanted to give you a little bit of an update in general, sort of what's going on with the council, and then each of us is going to take a few minutes to talk about some of the different initiatives that we have going on for this year. Um, so if you don't know, the council is basically a unified network that promotes the health and well-being of children, youth, and families on Cape Cod and the islands. And really what this means to all of us is um, that we, the council, we don't provide direct services per se, but we work on building and strengthening the partnerships that do exist and mobilizing and uniting all of those who are working on or interested in issues around children, youth, and families. 
Um, and really, you know, collaboration is the name of the game. We're looking to try to maximize resources and programs and avoid duplication, which especially right now in this economy is really key to making things work and continue to work. Um, last year, we did an exercise with our steering committee, and of the 11 members that were surveyed, we had over 50 different networks represented. So we realized we go to too many meetings, but um, we were also doing a pretty good job of bringing in a lot of different voices and making sure that we have representation of the different things um, that were happening in the community at the table. Um, so we really feel like we're, we're sort of a ready-made outlet for collaboration for children and family issues. Uh, each summer, we go through a planning retreat process with our steering committee to develop a work plan and priority initiatives for this year. Uh, we've actually worked really hard over the past few months in professionalizing our collaborative as well. Um, we've done things like established term limits for our steering committee, um, worked on processes for clear communication amongst the, leader the leadership, uh, establishing membership levels and things like that to kind of advance the collaborative to, like I said, a more professional level. Um, as you probably know, the council was the authoring body for the three applications that were submitted to America's Promise for Barksville County to be named one of the 100 best communities for young people in the country. Um, and Barksville County was one of only 44 communities in the country that received that designation three times. Um, one of the things that, that uh, was part of that America's Promise application is um, looking at the five promises that all young children need to thrive. And even prior to submitting those applications, that's something that's been integrated into the work that we're all doing. Um, so those promises are safe places, opportunities to help others, caring adults, healthy starts, and effective education. So as we go through our initiatives, you'll see that we touch on all of those. Most of them touch on more than one. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the uh, Cape and Islands Youth Congress and our effective education initiatives. And I'll mention too, you have packets of information that talk in general about the council, our initiatives for this year, and then some more specific information. There's also a full list of our steering committee for this year as well. Um, so the Cape and Islands Youth Congress was sort of reinvigorated in 2006 at the request of a group of young people who were at our Children, Youth, and Family Summit in 2006. Um, you might remember it existed through the Sheriff's Office um, in the 90s and early 2000s before the funding was lost. And so this group of young people came to us and said, we want to bring this back, it sounded really neat, you know, can you help us do it? So we've been slowly working on building it back up over the past three years. We're going into our fourth year. Uh, we just had our first meeting last week. There's a lot of energy and excitement amongst the young people. Um, so they're high school aged. It's a youth leadership group. It's adult supervised, but really youth led. Um, some of the things that they worked on last year included composing a survey to recreation and community centers. Um, to ask what type of involvement young people had in planning for youth activities and whether they would be amenable to having young people involved in that process. Um, we worked on the Cape Youth Force Grant Making Program. So they gave out $4,000 to six different organizations on the Cape um, that are serving students in grades 7 through 12. And they made all the recommendations on that, which was a really neat process. Um, and they also helped plan the youth track at the Youth Summit. So we're, we're thinking that some of those things are going to continue. It's a new group, so they'll have new ideas as well. Um, and then under the effective education category, uh, there are a number of us here who are involved with the Workforce Investment Board's Graduation Rate Committee. And so we're really working on trying to strengthen uh, partnerships between community-based organizations and schools to try to build up those support services for the students that are at risk. Um, there's also interest among the group in working on um, increasing diversity education in the schools. So those are some of the things in those two categories. So I'm going to turn it over to Beth Gaffney, my co-chair, um, who's going to talk about the summit. Good afternoon, I'm Lynn Gaffney. I'm going to use Child Care Network, which is a program of the Community Action Committee. And as Kristen said, I'm the other co-chair for the council this year. And I'm sorry, Carrie. Um, I'm just going to take a minute and bring you up to date about the summit, which is one of our annual events that the council sponsors. Um, it's, for those of you who are not aware of the summit, it is an opportunity for us to connect the, the participants to local resources, discuss issues that are imp impacting our children, youth, and families, and to highlight some of the uh, best practice models. And um, so we really, it's a wonderful event we have attended. Um, we get a couple hundred people each year, and a lot of good stuff comes out of it. Um, we, our planning committee for this year is very enthusiastic. Um, one of the things we noted last year was we had the most youth involvement, and the planning committee does not want to maintain and even increase the youth participation. So as we plan ahead, we're looking at having workshops with youth as presenters, having um, them 
be a real integral part of the event. Um, the last few years we had the event at Four Seas. We um, are thinking that maybe it's time to look at other locations to better meet the community. So we have been looking at other locations, including the new youth and um, community center in Hyannis and Harwich Family Service Center. And so we are still, those those logistics are still tentative. We have a tentative date of March 12th. Luke is sending out a save the date, so if you get one across your desk, please pencil us in. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to turn it over to Carrie, I believe. Oh, well, that went fast. <laughs> okay, good afternoon. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to be really brief as well. Um, the first thing that we just wanted to mention, I'm sure you all know that there's a commission on the status of grandparents raising grandchildren um, uh, that began work in January of 2009 at the State House. And I was fortunate enough to be named to that commission. And I'm actually um, vice chair of the commission. And we have kicked off our work by conducting a listening tour across the state. Um, and you have a, um, a flyer um, of the dates and the places um, of the listening tour. However, we did, we've begun those tours, but we have felt that um, it didn't quite meet the needs of our Cape Cod community. Um, the closest tour was in Bourne. We have a lot of families on the lower outer Cape. So the Cape Cod Neighborhood Support Coalition has added an additional um, tour here across the Cape, and I'm hoping some of you will be able to attend, and I'm thinking maybe within your um, geographic mm -hmm. areas. Um, so I'm just going to give you a couple of upcoming dates. On uh, November 19th, we are tentatively looking at the Forestdale School in Sandwich, who have identified themselves as having an, uh, a large number of grandparents raising grandchildren within their school system and have called repeatedly for some, um, some years. Um, and also Cape Cod Children's Place on December 3rd at 5.30, Sheila. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And um, that's in East Ham, for those of you who don't know. Those are the two that we have projected at this time, and we're going to be looking at January of 2010 um, to get a few more. Um, the council has decided um, that the way to handle the grandparents uh, raising grandchildren um, trend is to just incorporate it in all of the um, work that we do within the five promises. So that's how we're um, looking at that at this time. Can I ask you to back up yes. for just a second? Okay, so the one at the Cape Cod Children's Place is at 5.30 on what date? Uh, December 3rd. December 3rd. And on the 19th, what time is that going to be? 5.30. Okay. Thank you. And those are going to provide babysitting and snacks so that um, grandparents can attend. Uh, second order of business is the Child Care Planning Committee of the Barnesville County Council for Children's Families. Um, Beth Gaffney is here. She's on that committee. Uh, Cindy Horgan is on that committee. I am as well. As you know, child care um, also includes the after school hours, which is my um, probably 90% of what I do here for the county. Um, in front of you, you have hot off the press some um, handouts from a conference call in the uh, Massachusetts statewide contact for the 4-H after school program nationally. We have a conference call once a month. We had a call yesterday at 2 o'clock. And um, there's a uh, editorial from yesterday's New York Times called Home Alone, which talks about the um, the uh, you know advances and the uh, deficits that we have with um, uh, after school at this time. We have you know made some strides, but we're also obviously struggling with the economy, and um, many families are without childcare. Um, the good news is that attached to that, by the way, there's also data from the National After School Alliance that came out in that meeting, um, and they are very accurate statistics on what we're looking at in terms of national uh, trends for after school programs, needs, um, and that within the Home Alone article, it talks about how there's $40 million right now that's been approved by the House for after school programs that's going to the Senate. and. Obama did say he was going to be um, looking at that when he was um, running for presidency a year ago. So we're hoping anyway that that money comes through because families desperately need it. And um, that is, just want to call that one to your attention. Um, in terms of the child care planning um, project, and um, as you remember a couple of years ago, there was a report that, was, that came out through the um, county that Christine Johnson saw authored. There were a number of recommendations that were made, and it was really hard to sort of tackle all of those. 
So one of the things that we started last year was to look at what we could do. And what that um, turned out to be was that we could support the professional staff that's working after school with children with professional development and to try to do a better of collaborating and seeing what services we could trade off. Um, last year, we uh, there were three um, sessions held, in, one in Harwich, one in Hyannis, one in Mashpee, to um, increase professional development skills among after-school providers. We had about 75 after-school providers attend those meetings. Uh, the council sponsored a second, I mean, I'm sorry, a fourth um, professional development at the Dennis Police Department on May 1st, and we had about another 25 after-school uh, staff attend that professional development, so they were well attended. And um, we were able to do that last year, and um, Christy, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Cindy asked me to be sure to let you know that uh, we are continuing to do that this year to try to um, improve the skills of our staff by um, you know, offering these professional development opportunities. Um, she gave me some examples. She's going to do a whole day of training for Cape Cod Child Development, and they in turn are going to provide some professional development for her, so there will be no money exchange but an exchange of services. Um, and then the council through our network design encourages us to work together rather than agency against agency, so that's what we will continue to try to do. And she also said that Kristen Lynn from uh, Child Care Network is trying to continue this um, opportunity to provide opportunities for professional development. So that's what we're looking at in terms of the uh, council. Um, and my final reminder to you is that tomorrow's Lights On After School, mm -hmm. October 22nd at Boys and Girls Club. I know you've all been invited. And um, just reminding you that this is a day when we remember um, that uh, there are many people in our community who do keep the lights on for children after school with very um, important programs. And um, just want to remind you that that's tomorrow at 4, 5 o'clock, Boys and Girls Club. Thank you. Boys and also, Girls. yes. And we'll also be a sponsor um, by uh, Russell County 4 H. Thank you. And that's going to be held at the Boys and Girls, Boys and Girls, Boys and Girls Club. Um, and they're going to honor Judge Rue. Yes. yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. We uh, are community champions. Excuse me. Yes. Okay, so uh, um, every year we pick one person in the community um, who does incredible work on behalf of children, youth, and families. Last year, as you know, it was Mary LeClaire. Um, this year, it's Judge Joseph, retired Judge Joseph Reardon from our district court, who um, sort of fathered in the, the project Cape Cod Justice for Youth Collaborative, which then... Um, um, gave birth to the Youth Empowerment Initiative, um, which I believe Steve Brown is on the um, uh, agenda to speak about next. Mm -hmm. So there's my segue. <laughs> Very well done. <laughs> Very good. Sorry. Sorry, Steve. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you, Kristen and Carrie and Beth, for your introduction. And thank you to the county commissioners and to Barnstable County for your support of this work over many years. Um, as you know, uh, the, all of this work is based on data that's gathered that identifies both the needs and actually more significantly the uh, assets that the community has uh, for children, youth, and families. And much of that hard data is thanks to the research that the county does, and we really appreciate your support of that research in an ongoing way. Uh, I speak very briefly about the Cape Cod Justice for Youth Collaborative, which, as Carrie told you, was founded by Judge Reardon uh, three years ago and is uh, a continuum of services for young people, starting with prevention, going all the way through to reintroduction into the community following incarceration. It's been uh, very active and very successful having uh, working groups. Kathy Quatramini and then Carrie Bickford are both of my colleagues on the steering committee of that organization, so jump in, you guys, if you have uh, if you have information to share. One of the things that the Cape Cod Justice for Youth Collaborative did was partner with the University of Massachusetts Donahue Institute, my employer, uh, to establish the Cape Cod Youth Empowerment Initiative. Cape Cod Youth Empowerment Initiative uh, has uh, so far given $208,000 in capacity building grants to small grassroots organizations, nonprofits on the Cape that serve uh, at-risk youth. Uh, we're in the midst of our third round of soliciting grant applications in your packet. You'll see uh, our, our grant uh, RFP has a yellow cover, and we have three 
bidders conferences tomorrow beginning in Provincetown at 10 a.m. at the Provincetown Art Association Museum continuing on to Hyannis at 1 o'clock in the afternoon at the Federated Church and then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon at the Cape Verdean Club in Falmouth. Uh, please share this application with any nonprofit organizations that serve children and youth. And significantly this year, the federal government has allowed us to expand our, our service area to include homeless, to include elders at risk, to include prisoners and children of prisoners, people in transition, addicts, as well as, uh, as uh, children, youth, and families. So we'll be busy for the next uh, two months preparing our second, our third round of grants, which will be $105,000. Uh, and again, this is the University of Massachusetts working together with the Cape Cod Justice for Youth Collaborative and with Barnstable County to bring these resources into the county to build the capacity of small grassroots organizations. And you hear a lot of talk about having shovel-ready projects. What we do is we enable organizations to, to be shovel ready so that when resources become available, they are qualified and capable of applying for those resources. So we're hoping that these grants that we have given will be leveraged to bring further resources here into the county. So that's how it all connects together. And in your file, you also have a flow chart which describes how the Barnstable County Council for Children, Youth, and Families, which uh, uh, Kristen and Beth co-chair relates to the Cape Cod Justice Youth Collaborative, which Carrie and Kathy and I are involved with, and relates to the Cape Cod Justice, uh, Youth Empowerment Initiative, which is the grant-making organization. Uh, please feel free to call me anytime to email me. Our website is just compassionmassachusetts.org. We post stuff on it almost every day, and there's a blog there that you can participate in. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak with you, and stay in touch. I, I, I have one question. Could you just give me an example of some of the organizations that apply these grants? I mean, yes. I can give you a couple of examples. One is St. John's Church in Sandwich, uh, which has applied for a capacity building grant to develop a youth-led, youth-managed program. Uh, for providing services to youth when school was not in session, and that program is very successful. It serves all youth. Not, it's not a religious program. It's right. a program that they sponsor that serves all youth. They have had a number of dances over the summer. They had a dance in Orleans. They had one in uh, Yarmouth. And then they've had several dances at the Grange in Sandwich. Mm -hmm. That's one example from the Upper Cape. From the Mid Cape, one of the associates is the Calvary Baptist Church, which you are probably familiar with, that uh, serves between 150 and 200 meals every night to people uh, and families in the town of Barnstable, Monday through Friday. Uh, they're an associate along with Church Women United. Church Women United has uh, also a youth-led, youth-managed organization that does street reach, which is working with homeless people in Hyannis and teenagers from throughout the Cape. We'll work with that. And then for an example from, uh, from the Outer Cape, uh, the Provincetown Art Association and Museum works in collaboration with the Brewster After School Child Care Program, now called the Nauset Youth Alliance. And what they have done is they have been able, through the capacity building that we offered, to open after school programs for older youth in the Nauset Middle School, taught by students who have been through the program at Nauset High School and uh, freshmen at Cape Cod Community College. So what that has done is that's opened up a whole other piece for after school programs for older youth. And the older youth are in the program. They're also doing their own television program uh, about the program. So that's examples from the three ends of the cave. That's excellent. Yes. On the, uh, when you say incarceration, is, uh, does that mean the county jail? Does that mean DSS custody for halfway, let's say for a residential placement? You know, what exactly does that mean well, in terms of reintegrating uh, That was the federal language that they gave us, and we have a funding advisory committee made up of community members, not me. I don't make the decisions, I manage it. And I'm sure, I won't say I'm sure, but I would think that they would interpret that definition broadly uh, that people re entering the community from the Barnstable County House of Correction or from juvenile facilities as well. Yes. I, I think that uh, this is very important. There are a lot of kids 
in, in different secondary schools in the Cape that have uh, been expelled or put into uh, uh, temporary residential placement and then uh, just as suddenly you know, brought back to the community. Mm -hmm. So my concern is that uh, while there's something on paper that says that the support for kids once they're incarcerated and once they come back to school, the, uh, the observation that I have is that they are let out and they go back to school and they're basically given a lecture and if they... If they that's a really like good point. I'm actually going to be meeting with the Funding Advisory Committee at 1.30 today, so I'll bring that to their attention, and they will, uh, uh, I'll tell them where it came from. I have one other thing to add to that. The biggest concern that I have is that when children leave a community and the support system that supported their behavior prior to being incarcerated, it needs to be something that replaces that support system of a more positive way because otherwise you go back to the people that accept you. So this is, you know, this is a very good case. This is a from the Cape Islands District Attorney's Office and um, thank you for having us. Um, from our end, we're a prosecuting agency, so we're at the other end of the spectrum. However, Michael O'Keefe, many years ago, before it was the county council, it was a task force, assigned us to come and participate. So here we are all these years later, and the connections in the community that were maybe initially made through our own diversion program, because we're not clinical assessors of behavior or drug counselors or anything, we count on these community organizations. So to provide those services to the kids we have that we're trying to divert from this life that we don't want them to live. So all of this, all of these services that are available are very important to the district attorney's office. I, I would like to, um, and, and the obvious benefits of these diversion programs and all of these connections are reducing costs across the board, exactly. no matter where. It, I mean, the data is in, we know that. Um, the uh, one really good example, I think, right now that's happening is um, this afternoon, Everyone's talking about um, mentors. It's, there's money, federal money for this, there's mentors. The kids need mentors. There are kids floating around. And this is something directly to your point, uh, Mr. Doherty. Um, we have a staff person at the district attorney's office whose husband works at the base. We know all the mentoring agencies, Girl Scouts, YMCA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We need so there's a meeting occurring at 1.30 at Mass Mentor with the individual, with all of the groups, to work out some details of how we can get this mass of people that want to mentor, that have expressed interest in this, to connect to these organizations. Mm -hmm. And that's something that the council is supportive of and instrumental in, and that we are very supportive of. Um, in terms of the Youth Empowerment Initiative, I would like to cite one really good thing that's happening right now, that Cape Mediation is training for high school students two from Bonstable, one from Falmouth, and one from Mashby, Monday, Tuesday this week, to actually try to mediate some of these issues in their schools, to go back to the schools. It's a first. We've been very supportive of that, and it is, it's happening, and we're hoping to expand that, maybe in connection with the Youth Congress, but the connections are unbelievable, the network we have here, and I, I think it's really good that you had us over to talk, and please don't hesitate to call on any of us with any questions. Thank you. Kathy, could you talk a little bit more about the diversion? I mean, I, I know that you incorporate these agencies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but but a, um, a youngster's been incarcerated. Maybe they have a drug problem, and they're going to go, uh, now they're clean, and now they're going to go back into their neighborhood, which right. is, we all know, um, the first step going back to your right. old habits. Right. Um, how do you lure them into this program? I mean, isn't there a, um, uh, isn't there sort of like a, that, that you ask these kids to participate in the diversion program and they stay clean? I mean, what is... Yeah, they wouldn't have been incarcerated and be in diversion. The okay. diversion program specifically addresses first time okay. minor offenses and that's for the juveniles under 17, under age 17. Then we have another component for the 17 to 21s. It's really focused on substance but we're including first time shoplifting, trespass, those kinds of things. That's when we get them, before they go before a judge, okay. which would trip a court. Okay. 
we talk to them. It's voluntary. They don't have to come in. And frankly, many of them don't because we require so them to do so many things that it's almost easier for them to go before the judge. They don't understand the importance of the query necessarily, although we try to explain that. That could follow you, it does follow you for the rest of your life. So when they agree to come in, they're subject to, they all do community service. They all have to take responsibility for their actions. They all have to write a letter, um, an essay actually, it's a two-page essay about what they learned from the beginning to the end. I mean, it's a thought-provoking process. Um, certain offenses, uh, an assault or drug, they would be sent to a counselor for assessment. Then we get, we have caseworkers, we get the report back, and if, the, if further counseling is recommended, then they have to do that. But I think what makes the difference is this: an individual attached to our office who is overseeing the process, who is in touch with them, and we just tell them once, and then they're on their way six months later. You find out they haven't done anything. We work with them all the way through. And without these organizations, we wouldn't be able to do perform all those functions. So basically, that's, and they get a completion letter, and there's no query, it's no prospect. We hold it open until they do, and they know all of this ahead. They sign a contract. They all do like community service. And I have to say that in talking with some of the kids, when you say community service, you know, you're a little, you know, and you say, we want you to pick something you like, and you can see, pick something I like. <laughs> I mean, how do you encourage? But it's just a small thing, but it's still, you know, they, they, they're going to be sent to some place they don't want to go. Right. What good is that for anyone? Nobody learns anything. So, right. And we've had experience with community service. They've been hired later. Right. Um, there's no direct supervision. We do all that. And if the person doesn't show up, their part of taking responsibility is to make your schedule, to keep your schedule, and we get reports back. We don't expect them to discipline. We get that all kicked back. But mm -hmm. very, I would say very little problem with that. But I think it's the contact, the individual one on one. And what is the contact with the families of these children? Oh, well, juveniles bring their parents. Okay, so, so parents are yeah. involved from the right. beginning of the process. Yes, through. yes. So and any questions were available for anything special that comes up in communication, we're not. We have certain rules around drug, we'll drug test them all the way through, and you know, it's not, nothing's automatic. It's a case by case. Every case is different, every situation is different. There are many times, as my colleagues can say, extenuating circumstances, you've all seen it in the families. You just can't make a rule like that, so right. we, we involve the parents. Now, one of the issues with the older kids, they don't have to come with a parent. I mean, I know I would go with mine. I don't care how old it would be, I would be there. Right. And so they, no, nah, I don't want to do that. I don't right. do that. So they have more of their own life in their hands. They don't, yes, yes, yes. I'm thinking specifically of the, the adolescent group between 13 and 17. Yes. And one of the things that you, know, you bring a parent in. Now, a parent at public school is more likely taking taking a person out of employment. You know, mm -hmm. two parents or even one parent right. at home all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the issue becomes if the requirement is to, for is, is the, if the onus is put on the parent to provide a higher level of supervision, mm -hmm. how do they do that mm -hmm. without losing their employment? Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I well, just yeah. worry about that. And the other piece is that the threat that comes out of DSS or DYS about uh, okay, if your urine is dirty, you know, uh, you know, you're going to go, you're going to be in DYS custody until you're 18 years old or forever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how effective. You know, that really is right. as far as as far as setting up a framework and guidance to let's say to replace the let's say the, the habit and the milieu that have been set up right. based upon what has existed prior to getting, getting to that point. It, it's definitely a problem, but we don't require the parents to increase supervision. We're at least for the six months. I mean, hopefully they're supervising their children, but we know sometimes that doesn't happen. But w that's what the you know the caseworker independently contacts, and it's like we tell the parents, you're not in diversion. You know, and part of learning responsibility for that, it lies there. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. The threats. Because once you make the threat, it's on the table, and you don't deliver. Right. You're, you point the just, it's ridiculous. Right. It's ridiculous. So we believe in the treatment, and we believe in treating again and again. But you know, the horse to water, you have to be have to have a willing participant. We try in all of our ways to encourage them to know it's important. It's not always doesn't work, but we stick with them. Some of the kids that are out of the program will call a caseworker back. Right. I mean, we've had that too. But the biggest bulge that we get 
is that 13 to 16. I mean, we have had eight. We, pro you know, seven to 17 is technically. Now, do you want a young person to come in? It, no, we don't put them through the same thing. We've had some young kids draw posters and do things, you know, the teacher will come up with a project, but we send them to the brain injury program too, where they can hear from a peer if it's substance. They can hear someone who used to be this and now I'm this and can come in and talk at the, at the rehab hospital. They're mandated to go to an educational program. So we're trying, but we're open and my colleagues can say, if you have something, we'll try to incorporate it. Right. So we're open to you know suggestions to improve the programs. But I have to say, the District Attorney O'Keefe, we've had this program for 10 years. We were early on with it, and I think it's working to some extent. I can't give you causal data, but I can give you a correlation, who we hear from again and who we don't, because we look at that recidivism. Right. So anyway, if any of you have any questions in the future, contact me. I think it's a great program, and um, and uh, I, I commend the district attorney for, for sticking with it all these years. Yes. And I just wanted to add that um, some of the questions in the dialogue that you're having about reentry and um, you know those all those um, issues that we know are existent in the community are conversations that we're having at the Cape Cod Justice Youth Collaborative, um, looking at how can we strengthen the communities and how can we make some changes for people coming back in. So um, those are all the conversations we're having. So you're invited to come to a meeting anytime and you know give us more input. Um, Maybe I will, and I'll save my comment here. But I, I do feel that you know the more families are brought into it, because I think that sometimes we're we're almost in a dysfunctional state, and which makes you know families and children and everyone somewhat dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And everybody's hurrying. We're all under stress of economics. Everyone's got two or three jobs. Everybody wants that kid to grow up quick so that they can be responsible for themselves. So adulthood is thrust on these kids way before they're even intellectually uh, ready for it. And um, so I think that the parents need as much help there as, as uh, everyone else because although they, they love their kids and they're trying to do the best they can, not everything, you, know, you end up barking at your kid and they bark back and then there's that, that uh, pattern that starts and it's, uh, it's not a healthy one. So. I, I just think it's it's uh, great stuff that you're doing. So I'm glad you were here today. Oh, yeah. Now we have, okay. <laughs> I just want to one, one, one more, more person. Yeah. That's right. One, one more. PJ, I want to know about the. Um, but real quick, before I talk about our newest initiative, PJ Richardson from the YMC Cape Cod, I wanted to kind of fill in some of the blanks with the reentry portion of what you guys are discussing. For two years now, the YMCA Cape Cod has been working with um, the old colony YMCA through a program um, that DYS operates out in Nickerson State Forest. And um, the, the portion of that, there is an incarceration program there for youth, but the portion that the YMCA Cape Cod chose to work in is um, the Brewster Treatment Facility, and it's the six months prior to um, these youth being released back into the community. And what we do is we spend those six months um, working with them using adventure-based counseling techniques to help them, help better equip them to get ready to re-enter society. That has been underway for two years now. Recently, uh, two months ago, the Department of Corrections, I believe it is, issued a, a new program that is community-based in design. It's not there yet, but in design, it's a community-based program that would then, uh, and that contract was awarded to the old Colony YMCA as well. And what uh, the YMCA Cape Cod feels they're able to do is plug the council with all of these wonderful community-based organizations into that <coughs> So I can't say yet what it will look like, but we do have, we have laid the groundwork for us to be able to access all the things that we have to offer as a community for the kids that have been incarcerated and are now coming back to our community. So, so your questions are very pertinent, um, but there is some very uh, preliminary work being done at the ground level that I think in a year to two might yield what, what you guys are talking about. Um, Personally, I've seen the results of it when you see these kids out in the community and they're back and, and they're comfortable walking up to the staff of mine that they've worked with and, and they, they come up to them with them all and say how great of an experience it was and hey, I got a job now and I'm on the right track and that kind of thing. So it does work. Uh, it's a very slow process. 
Talk, talk about your, um, I've attended a couple of them in the evening there. You have uh, the sleepover where all the, that is, is that the Congress that does that? That is part of the youth Congress. The youth Congress. The lock in, yeah. yeah. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a great program because here you have uh, youth of all different genre. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we could and say. Adults. Yeah. <laughs> and adults of all different genres. <laughs> Myself included and everyone here. Um, but uh, you know, if you see these kids walking down the street, you know, they you know, some of them might be very goth or very emo or very um, uh, you know whatever the case may be. And and yet to have them sit down in a room and actually give them um, the feeling that their opinion counts and their statements count, and that uh, they have some, they really have an incredible perspective on things. When you bring public officials in, they have excellent questions, and they're not afraid to. You know, they haven't been, uh, you know, jaded not to ask such things or trained not to. So it's really an incredible uh, process. And I know that you all work really hard there. It's, it's I, I a lot think of it's, fun in the end. Yeah, I think it's one of the most important things about the youth congress is that, that every youth has a voice. <coughs> And no matter what your situation is or what your background is or anything, you, you have an equal voice to everyone else. And then you're empowered. And thanks to the foundation, we're actually able to give them resources to go out and solve some of the problems in their own community. And there's nothing more beautiful than that. But the one situation that, that you're referencing uh, is probably one of the most memorable ones for me in terms of Youth Congress. And that was listening to a young man who a year earlier was on the on the brink of homelessness dropping out of school um, luckily he had a vice president at his high school that, that took an interest in him and, and got him back on track and then to have to hear him have a discussion with state representative turner right. on, on on such a, a a meaningful adult level a very respectful two-way conversation was, was amazing you know it, it was uh, amazing and the reality I mean, you saw his reality. It's, I mean, you, you, we get a sense of what that is. Yeah. But to really uh, hear it from uh, the person, the horse's mouth, so to speak, uh, was, was really an amazing. That was a great night. That yeah. was a fun night. No, it was it. a cold night. It was a yeah. night. <laughs> Good morning. So. so I'm actually here to talk to you guys a little bit about our newest endeavor, which is... Um, recently named the Coaching Alliance, or it's either the Coaching Alliance for Cape Cod or Barnesville County Coaching Alliance. We're still playing around with all that. And what we started to do, thanks to um, Kevin Turner, the uh, acting superintendent in Harwich Public Schools, he has this energy and passion for um, equipping our volunteer coaches that coach in all our sports across the Cape. We have a, a huge wealth of them. We're, we're not short on volunteers. There's wonderful people on Cape Cod that are willing to give, but they're not necessarily equipped with all the skills that you need to work with today's youth, today's families, and today's challenges. Mm -hmm. So what the Alliance is hoping to do is to share everybody's resources and come up with uh, some kind of offering that these agencies who don't have the resources individually to, to train the volunteer coaches in this type of thing um, be able to bring those resources to them and then just share them to them. Uh, so it's one less burden for them to take on as individual agencies and more of a, uh, a systematic approach for everybody to be able to access it. Not really sure what shape it will take. We've had some preliminary meetings. We do hope to have something out for the spring that people can start to buy into, and, and we feel that it's um, very timely. You know, there's been articles in the Cape Cod Times re recently uh, entitled Poor Sports. We've all seen it through the years, the, 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 the negative turn um, that some of these influences have had in our youth sports, and we're just hoping that through a community-based approach that we're going to be able to give something back out to the community that better equips them to deal with parents, to deal with um, issues of violence, to deal with issues of counseling. You know, you're no, you're no longer a coach. You're also their guidance right. counselor. You're also their parent in a lot of ways. Right. Um, so dealing with that across all the different spectrums that exist here on Cape Cod. So not sure what, what shape it will take, but uh, there has been a lot of very positive interest in this effort, and we hope to uh, to be able to come back to you next year and report on some great progress. I'd be interested, yeah, maybe Kevin will come in with, with you, but uh, yeah, Kevin, uh, that, that's, that's a good thing. Thank you. Just one question. Yes. I think it's so important 
that we, when you're working with kids, give them the responsibility of coming up with solutions. We don't know what the problems are, but the kids that uh, come up with solutions to their own problems will probably sustain those solutions to go forward. So I think it's very important to you know put that onus on them that it's their life and it's the, you know it's their opportunity to work on the solution to use the resources that you know they're making available. Okay. Thank you. And so, even one more thing that I forgot to mention, and it's a kind of a, an appeal. Um, the Redevelopment Office, the grant writers, and this is not for the council, but this is more for the justice for youth and for the youth empowerment. We are going into the last year of that grant. We'd like to kind of get on board, and it wouldn't be not asking for them to do the job. I was asking if we could, if we identify a grant, or maybe they could identify we'd work with them. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we could consider? Yeah, mm -hmm. they are. Of course. I, I, think, I think that okay. would yeah. not be a okay. problem at all. Good. That's within, right. that's within the scope of the right. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, yes. Oh, okay. No, you <laughs> I just wanted to thank you again for taking so much time with us and just acknowledge you know, your, your support <laughs> presently and in the past. And I also want to thank Beth and the Department of Human Services for all the support over the years that they've given us, too. So um, we always appreciate opportunities to work together moving forward. So thank you again. Okay, well, thank you. I, I just have a question. I, I'm just curious about what relationship you might have with school. is the head man and he's called the meeting for next week so we're at that table and their conversion they just don't have the time but the lines of communication are open with them and we see them where they are mm -hmm. as a very important link for us so that's something that we're always cultivating okay. yes maybe so if i can i just ask carrie would you reach out to darlene on um, the grant assistance to make sure that there's Everything is square, and that there aren't any issues with you know nonprofit status, etc. So just and just keep me in the loop. But okay. just communicate to her what you're looking for, um, and so and if there are any issues, then we can try and work them out. Right. Great. Thank That's you. Excellent. Beth, do you have anything you'd like to? You know, I'm sitting here thinking. I I just commend all of you for the great work that you do. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm continually impressed, and I think the connections and the networking and the new projects and 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 all the work that you do is you're all to be commended for. So thank you. Yes, yes, thank you all very, very much. And now back to work. Yes, sorry. Are you all off to that 1.30? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good to see you. All right, glad to have you here. All right. Do we have any public comment? That's just leak. That's, um, that's, yeah. that's Nancy. I can run a speech. Oh, <laughs> well, you uh, you came to a very good meeting. Yes, extremely important. It was. Now I have a couple of uh, things I would like. Do you have something you'd like to ask? Well, I do have a question. Then. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Well, that is very good. But I'm just wondering what proportion of you coming to them refused. The help, and, and, and I can wondering. That's a very good question. Steve is going to grab Kathy. Let me Yeah, just to call her for a second, Kathy? if she's right out there. Yeah. Could, could we have a follow-up? We need to know who we're reaching and who we are, and, and what kind of Steve? It's so hard to trace. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think it's. I think it's. I think Kathy can answer this. I swear. <laughs> I think you can answer this. Jerry uh, has a. Um, Jerry has a question. I, I was wondering, out of all of the youth who come to you, what proportion don't take the services? Um, I would say on the juvenile side. Yeah, most take it. Most, most take it because you know there are other influences at the table. Yeah, yeah. Parents are yeah. and they'll they tend to believe everything you say too. So, but the other group, I would say it's probably seventy-five percent will take it. Uh -huh. Really, that high? Yeah. Fifty good. or seventy-five? Yeah, that's very good. Because we try to, you know, even if they have a defense attorney, which they don't normally have, we know them all. We say, look. Try to explain, you know, it's not just us saying it, it's like your work. Tell them. 
explain it to them. If you feel strongly and you don't want to take responsibility, well, that's okay, but we need you to take responsibility. So that's a good Yeah, thank you. I mean, yeah, that was a yeah that's a very good question. Yeah. And, and the other question is, so when you were saying that you sort of tailor it to the situation, if, say if a kid comes in and his drug test isn't clean, and you say, are you a drug test? And he said, look, you know, it was this night, you know, I was here, I, I knew I was wrong, I have tried, and he's, whatever. It, it, that doesn't bounce up necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah. No, okay. because we have a more of an interest in the treatment. In keeping the kid, right. Keep, yeah, I mean, what right. purpose does it serve? Because the exactly. first time is honestly, you know, it's a slap, because the court, that's not their business either. So they don't have anyone overseeing them. It's administrator. Right. Yeah, they're on probation. I mean, they think when they're with us, they're on probation. We just let them think that. Okay, probation with a small p. But we have much more contact. It's a regular contact. They remember. They don't forget. Right. They call us. It's back at email, of course. Now we use an email. We're not going to Twitter or any of that. But, you know, so it's... You know, no one really wants to do bad things or, yes. or hurt themselves. But when you don't have the tools or the skills, and even those around you who love you may not have that direction and and be able to give you the resources or, or understand them themselves, it's very tough to kind of figure it out on your own. So I think it's a great link. It, you know, we're always looking for ways because not every child responds, not every person responds to the same stimuli. And so we're right. constantly looking at just saying it a different way. And I have to say, the county council, they're yeah, they're great. Yeah, they they are. And, you know, it's very selfish perspective. But, you know, we're in there working on prevention and intervention because we don't want them in there. We want to stem that flow. Right. We all have an interest in that. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, all right. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks again, Kathy. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Okay, I have a um, I have a request uh, and a follow up from Brenda, who is with the Tick. Brenda, follow up, call in. Oh, sure. Um, uh, if Lyme you remember, disease, there was a Lyme disease. She had uh, requested that maybe in the fall they would like to do a conference on this. They are asking mm -hmm. for December 10th from 10 to 12. Of course, I forgot my notes when I ran out the door. Uh, Bill Clark would be uh, uh, part of this sponsorship. They want to inform everyone of the uh, of the dangers of tick and the different legislation that is occur taking place uh, in the state house. This is a Saturday. It's a Saturday, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this um, is an educational forum? It's an educational, I believe it's an educational. I'm or? not sure exactly how all of that is, but they're asking for that date. And um, I understand the point they're asking. Let me. I, I, I had my notes down. I'm going to write okay, it. Okay, so on December 12th, the Lyme disease forum between 10 and 12 on, uh, on that Saturday. And yeah, where do they really propose to have it? It was going to be hopefully around 11 and 12. Do I have that date right? Yes, for the December 10th task force meeting. Okay. So a it's chance. a task force. That's a Wednesday. Okay, I said the 10th. Did it yeah. December 10th? Okay. Okay. The 10th, okay. Yes. And, um... Uh, at the end of the year, hoping the commission's cohort would be able to host and co-host as we need to initiate reappointments to the task force. She has been the leader of this task force for uh, in her nine years now, and they, I think she would like to um, pass the baton. I would, I would really miss her. She's, Brenda has done more for oh. this task force than yes, anybody. Yes, but you know. Um, Does she have a recommendation for her task She may, hopefully. I would, I would uh, like to hear from her. Okay. Well, I just wanted to, to know that if Oh, I'm sorry. It's I said 10 to 12. If they would like to do it at 4 o'clock in this room, December 10th. I apologize. Good thing she sent me that night. Since I so they want to have the task force meeting here. Yes. So and they would like us to host and co-host and help get that information out and that sort of thing. So I think. Um, well, I, I think that's a great idea. I think that uh, Bill Clark would probably uh, have the lines 
of distribution of organizations that should be advised and informed of it. Right. And I think we should. I, I, I would like to recommend that we do take a part in sponsoring. Three of you are there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. And uh, also George Hoyfelder will be uh, part of this. So it's it's really Brenda, Bill, and George that are. Uh, I'll touch base with the two department heads and then update you next week on availability and what they're doing. And I can also bring the list of the appointments and the passports to them take would fire. Be and what day did you say, December 10th? It's, it's a Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday. Okay. Well, the ADC meets on the oh, first Thursday. Thursday. Oh, it's 10th. a Thursday. Yeah. 10th. Thursday. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a Thursday. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I will bring this back under under the administrator's report next week. Okay. And Mark or I will follow up. That's Excellent. Good. And uh, did I have anything else? I think that was it. Okay. If I yes, no, 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 sure. Can we have if you have remove your? Um, I have a couple of questions on that. Sure. Um, um, number fourteen. Uh, the um, Tyler Technologies, I'm assuming, is the financial provi uh, the provider of the financial computer services? Or? I believe so, but you have it in front of you, so I have to pull it and confirm it. Oh, okay. It's a contract yes. with them that for to, to this office, to, yes. to the county office? Correct. Okay. And the details and the cover sheet are, in this. are right there in front of you. Okay. Actually, they're in the blue folder. If you want to pass me that, I can pull it. You know, that's okay. I was just curious as to um, they already provide the financial. What do I want to say? Software or application? No, Munis. Oh, Munis does, but Tyler Technologies is going to do the disaster recovery piece to it. Oh, okay. That's what I wasn't sure about. And number seven, well, seventeen. Um, I could ask seventeen and nineteen and twenty and twenty-one. Talk about. Special revenue accounts and new funds, and what are they? Exactly? When you have, um, this is a requirement for uh, sorry, auditing and accounting procedures, when we set up a new fund, and specifically on number 17, it could be a grant fund. Um, so you get a grant, you have to set up a fund and charter okay. accounts, and that requires authorization from the commission. Okay. The summer food program is the same exact thing. Every time we get a new grant, we set up a fund. A new fund. Just specifically for that, as opposed to commingling it in a department, which we never want to do right. in a department budget. These are new funds specifically, usually for a project and are related to um, grants and commits. Right, and those are, and the regional network is right. part of that state. Um, as the oh, I was, it lead was just, agency on the that. terminology. That was yep, all. I just it wasn't just clear what that meant. Fund. So I would move the um, actions one through twenty-four. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, in addition to your action items, you have, and I um, apologize for this, this came rather quickly, Pat is signing her life away. You have several multiple contracts in front of you for our health nurse, nurses, nurses oh, for the for various flu clinics. Yes. George is having a training. That has come, he has to have it this Saturday, and has just finished the interview process for our nurses this week. So I'm asking that you sign uh, the contracts first. And this is a you know, a paid training, so in order for them to participate, you need to sign, and then they will be required to sign before attending Saturday's workshop. Okay. So that is not on your your action items, but because it came in rather suddenly, and due to the timeliness of this and the urgency, mm -hmm. I authorized George to bring them in to you for you to sign. And I these are contracts with individual nurses. Yes. To to administer the yeah. blue shirt right. across across the the cape. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, we give you shots here. Yes. We are in the flu the seasonal flu shot clinic was cancelled and it will be rescheduled. You will be if you signed up the first time you will be contacted by Rita Mitchell. Um and then you there may not be a, a, a if you did not sign up the first time you should um, speak to me privately because I do not believe there's any extra shots, so I'll have to speak okay. to Rita. It's not easy to find any place these days that has right. the flu so shots. Should, we should speak to Rita. Okay. Yeah. Um, and now I hear that even the seasonal flu shots they're running out. You know that there's some everybody's mm -hmm. fly. Got to run on them. Okay. That was it for me. Okay. Well, I can report on the fact that uh, Andrew Gottlieb and uh, Dr. Brian House and David DiLorenzo from DEP, who manages the 0% SRF fund, 
um, came to Falmouth Monday night and we had a wastewater workshop. And it, the, what was so good about it is that some people out in the community have certain uh, preconceived notions about wastewater, uh, particularly that the town's going to sewer everything and, right. that, and that alternatives are just not on the table. So they were able to dispel that notion, I thought, extremely well. And the, the second part of it was the, the funding, uh, because the, the funding has people always think the entire cost is either going to go on the tax rate and everybody's going to pay for it, or it's going to be 100% betterment, which is what happened in Barnstable. It happened and didn't happen, and I'm not sure where it is right now. But since then, we have had the 0% SRF from the state which is now has about eight years uh, or left to go on the, on the uh, 100 million. And then uh, we have the O'Leary Bill, which is um, if it's passed would allow uh, towns or any municipality to extend that borrowing for 50 years as opposed to 20 years. And, and maybe even other additional kinds of creative funding for wastewater may come up in the future. But anyway, I wanted you to know that they all did a very excellent job, and I think everyone in the town appreciated it. Uh, they also, Andrew was in um, Chatham on Saturday morning as well with the... Um, Nancy, do you want to speak to that a little bit? You could give us a little briefing on that? Some of my confused. Um, this was with the citizens, the concerned citizens? Of Chatham, well, this was sponsored by Friends of Chatham Waterway. Okay. To some extent, in response to something that had been held a couple of weeks before by the Chatham Concerned Taxpayers. Right. Chatham Concerned Taxpayers, I don't want to characterize their stamp, but basically they feel that this money is being expended without adequate thinking, thought given to it. Right. Um, Basically, also the speakers last Saturday, and there were a number of them. George Boyfelder was one. Um, uh, Andrew was another. Andrew was the other, another. Um, yeah, our Robert Duncanson, who is leading the Chatham mm -hmm. wastewater plan. Um, a couple other people. One from the Mass DEP. That's not Andrew. I don't think I brought it with me. Um, in any case, they very carefully, I thought, gave all the arguments for having the, the town completely sewered. Within reason, not that other considerations don't exist. There was a lot of talk about IAs. Um, one of the things that struck me, and I think it was Andrew who was talking about this, are extremely expensive to maintain. Yes. You pay a couple thousand, three thousand dollars a year for a maintenance contract. Then you have to have someone who sort of overseeing it on the solid time. When you try to sort it out as a taxpayer, mm -hmm. um, the conclusion gets clearer and clearer, like it or not. Right. Um, there was another alternative which had an acronym, which I can't tell you right now. It's okay. You don't have to give me everything. But, oh. but it was well received, and people it's, felt that they had better knowledge. I thought it was very well attended. Very good. And uh, uh, that's 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 Okay. Bill had a question. Uh, the chat was under a consent decree to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. Right. I think so. Okay. Yeah. So when these taxpayers say, how is the money being expended? They do know that they're supposed to. They they have no choice because it's been mandated that they do something. Right? right. Did they have any response about that? I can't speak um, for them. Just wondering. But okay. Chatham already has their SRF funding, mm. and that is that is worth so much. It's worth almost half the cost of the project. Mm -hmm. If you had to do it under normal borrowing, by having the SRF. <laughs> what is this on? Uh, the sewer relief fund. Yeah, the state revolving. The revolving fund, right. That's the no interest. Though. Yeah, 0% interest. That that, in fact, the savings, what I heard about the savings, that that, in fact, the savings, what I heard a couple of days ago, was in Chatham. The savings is going to be the the savings of having being able to borrow that money at 0% interest. Yeah, that's what I heard. That's what I heard. The savings of having being able to borrow that money at 0% would actually fund Chatham's municipal budget for a, a few years. 
I mean, it is it is that valuable yeah. in terms of the funding. Well, and we are trying to get, we, we've sort of advanced the schedule of that to get in on Simmons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's and the some other things. O'Leary's bill. A couple other things I wanted to mention, too, about that uh, that really came up and that was so important is the idea of citizen education that a municipality as the county has to do a much better job communicating with citizens over the long haul on a frequent and continuous basis so that they're very much aware of each stage of the planning and how it's going to affect them and they have an opportunity to have input into that. Good. The other one was what are the costs of not doing it? That's and exactly David DiLorenzo was from the state was so interested in that question that he has offered the support of the state to help any town take a look at what would be the cost if we do this into the future? Now, some people may be fortunate enough to have a Tile of Five system that's going to last them another 20 years, and they're going to move somewhere else, and, and it won't affect them. Um, but for the most part, it's going to affect everybody, and it is important to know what those costs are. And the third thing that was really emphasized was the importance of regional solutions. Mm -hmm. That regionalization really is the way to go about approaching this. It's not the solution, but it's the way to get to the solution. And, he, and the encouragement of every town, no matter where you are, to look at your neighbors and see what they're doing and how you can work together and save money in the process. So I think uh, the more we can keep those ideas and concepts in front of the public, the better off it is because we'll have people who can buy into it more if they understand how well, it's going to work. Um, the league is very much involved. Yes. We get more and more involved. We have one of the great champions in front of you. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we seem to have a combined meeting of the Chatham, Harwich, possibly Brewster, up on the Cape coming up in mid November. Yeah, and the Andrew Motley going to enjoy us. Lower case. Case. I mean, yes, upper case. Well, uh, things have happened more even since then, Jerry. It looks as if Chatham College is going to the upper case. Yeah. So, and Arlene, that lower case will be meeting on Sunday, November 14th, uh, on wastewater and clean water issues. Make sure we, oh, we get those, Bill, you yes, want to? Yes, can we get those dates and times? Because I think it's that, helpful I, for us. I, I would like to send get. you um, our monthly bulletin called the voter you get it because you're a I member do. but i don't have email for bill or for you then okay and uh, it just sort of tells you what our calendar is do you guys have one of your cards then you can give jerry your card yes uh, i think they're in our other desk if you don't have them wouldn't you just if you have if you have a piece of paper right there for jerry um Bill, did you have yeah, something you wanted to Yeah, uh, one, of the, one of the things in terms of creative financing is, is that I've heard discussed is that instead of putting the betterment on the owner, put the betterment on the property so that it becomes something that can be transferred with oh, the property. Oh, it does go on the property. That, that was my and it stays with the property. It's a lien on okay. the property. Because I think, that, I think that understanding that, that when somebody says that it's an impediment to selling the property, uh, because you know, they have to, they don't recover a lot of the money because it's all on that on that first owner. I think it's important to have you know, that people should be aware of that. Well, it stays with the property if the owner decides to extend the payments over 20 years. But if the owner pays up front, then it's written. I mean, there is no lien on property, so the the property owner has the option of paying it all at once or extending it out over Okay, but it's not the kind of lien that uh, interferes with the uh, sale of the No, it does not. Okay. Now, um, as you know, we are... Um, because it has to be paid off at the sale of the property. It doesn't go... In other words, the, the, the betterment doesn't go to the new owner, the pre present owner. It has to be still? paid off at the time okay. of sale. That's... That kind uh -huh. of thing reduces, you know, reduces the, uh, the gain of the person that they have. Well, yeah, but except that the new owner uh, doesn't have to pay for all of it. The uh, I, could you pass that to Bill for his uh, email? Oh, Bill, well, could you put your email on that? Yes. Um, uh, right now, we're taking public comment because we've had our um, we've had a uh, review committee. Uh, take a look at the water collaborative as it exists 
today in the county. And they came up with some specific uh, recommendations. And, and uh, they based their recommendations on looking at the situation at hand and where, you know, what was it that the collaborative was uh, given, what were their tasks? And what was their sort of report card? And, they, and they've done, a, you know, it's sort of like a, uh, a C, I guess you could say. They've gotten, um, they did a really good job in some areas. I mean, people's awareness of wastewater and the wastewater issues are much more in the forefront than they were. Um, I, I do believe that regionalization is happening, but I think a lot of that is happening out of necessity, and, and it's basically the requirement of this SRF bill, and people are wondering how it is. And they're, but it's sort of at a different level now. Now, now towns are there, uh, are at the point where they're saying, we know we have to do this. How can we, how, now the, the numbers are becoming astronomical. And, and I think that they're looking for a new um, line of communication, a new uh, uh, skill set to be had in the, in the uh, collaborative. That's basically the recommendations. I'll be happy to forward these to the league so you can take a look at them. Um, and uh, so we're taking public comment on the review uh, committee's recommendations to the 23rd. We may yeah, extend I think, that. I think a suggestion we do extend it. I, I, I have think been we getting have. a lot of public, let's say, a lot of interest, or more interest than I expected. Right. And that I think that uh, extending it for a week or so I, might be very useful I, in I, order I, to I, encourage I, 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 I agree. Yeah. Because it keeps the conversation going. It keeps people interested. And right now, people are sort of hearing one side. And we're hearing a lot of um, a lot of information from people um, who, uh, you know, when when a, when a committee is um, uh, has a, a review and the criticisms come out of it, and I'm sure if it happened to us, we would feel, you know, you, you can't help but take it a little personal. Uh, I and think, um, if I, if, if I, yeah, I don't think that we should dwell on how people responded to it. I think that our, that our responsibility is to listen to I, what everybody says, and I then at that time agree. we could make a comment on it. But I think that you know, the dwelling on, uh, you know, or somebody, uh, let's say somebody was a, had an emotional reaction to uh, you know, to what might appear to be a criticism, when yet we were only following the orders because the Assembly's ordinance very clearly said that at the end of five years we were supposed to have a review. Now we've done that review and we've received a committee report. Now just like the uh, task force that uh, created the collaborative, which incorporated that in there, and put in the responsibility of having that review, are you doing that? And I think that by encouraging people to participate and give their comments, we will be able to enter into the deliberation that was intended by the original ordinance. Now, if we did not do that, if we did not do that, we would not be following the direction that that original assembly commissioner uh, you know, or group uh, had intended. I agree. Having said that, I do think that some people are being alerted to the findings um, through different channels, and some of them might be. Um, I think the more you look at, the more you look at the ordinance itself and the recommendations and the situation that we're in as a county. People are looking for some leadership and direction as to how to go as communities, and I think that the. Um, Recommendations address that, and uh, what I'm what I'm saying is I'm assuming some of some of uh, your initial reaction. I am saying if it were us, I'm sure we would feel like you know, gee, we're trying to do a good job, and but it is what it is, and, and I think what it, what we have to do is take a look at what it is saying and try to move forward with that. Now we're in the implementation period. People have been educated. People understand the situation. How can we go further? The um, the one thing about Chatham uh, in that uh, that they did so well is uh, they saw down the road 10 years ago that this was going to happen and they did their budgeting process through uh, uh, um, their debt their debt uh, planning very well and they chose to do uh, full sewering because that was in some ways I think an equitable um, solution Hearing that and then seeing Barnstable not being able to, uh, having their plan together but not really looking at the cost uh, as carefully as maybe they could have and just, so between uh, one town saying we're going to sewer everything and the other town saying 
but we're only going to do it piecemeal and only some people are going to pay and you know I mean not being able to figure out the, the payment solution kind of put the situation back so I think that the more people understand that when people are talking about sewering in regional approaches to sewering regional approaches will keep the cape from being totally sewered because we're doing strategic um, uh, uh, partnering of towns where it can have the, the most benefit. You're getting more for less. And of course, those outer reaches will have these alternative septics, which will be hopefully better than, you know, once they've gone through their vetting process, um, better than the Title Fives, which we all know don't really take care of nitrates in the system. So. I one other thing to add on the committee's work, since I sat on the committee. One of the one of the motivations that the, you know, that the committee had was not just to look at where the you know, where the garden was, but come up with a suggestion of a solution that would meet what we would call the implementation strategy to go forward. Now, having said that, uh, I would, and I've said this to other you know to others who you know who talked to me about uh, you know what was the intention, and uh, and I've assured them that this is not a rubber stamp. Uh, you know, Board of Commissioners, we you know we have a deliberative process. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I would be very interested not in a restatement of the problem, but a suggestion on what a solution would be to actually implement what you know what what we need to do. Because many times we get so involved with where we are that we never figure out where where we need to go. Right. So I would suggest a Cartesian approach. This is where we want to go, and suggestions of solutions that would get us there would be very useful as far as as far as how I would look at it and compare that with what you know, with what the committee had done. When you speak of the committee, you're speaking of the review committee. The review yes, committee, yes. which was appointed by you all. Yes, it yes. was. The mandate yes. of the assembly for five right. years. Right, and that and that included uh, Florence Selden, whom you know yeah. from Chatham, and included uh, uh, Fred Ch uh, Cherry Gotis, who's the the president of the town council in Barnstable. Uh, it included uh, Maggie Geis from the uh, you know, Association for uh, Bench from Cape Cod, and included Elliot Carr, who's the chair of the business roundtable. Uh, uh, Joe uh, up in Bourne. Uh, Joe, Joe Carrera. Uh, Joe Carrera from you know, from Bourne. And I must be missing somebody. Uh, you oh, Gussie McKissick. Yeah, Gussie McKissick, McKissick from, uh, who, who had, Orleans. Who had recently been the uh, chair of the collaborative and, uh, you know, had, had stepped down with, you know, with the change of, uh, you know, of, uh, of uh, the election right. leadership. But in any case, I think that we had what I would call a representative sample of the elected and commercial community on Cape Cod, mm -hmm. as well as... Uh, you know, as well as people that are concerned about the, uh, you know, the preservation and the environment of Cape Cod. And, and I say this all the time. You know, we have to protect what we have, but we have to make wise choices for what we need. And since we all know we have a problem, we all know that, uh, you know, that 20 or 30 years from now, you know, we'll, we will be faced with the responsibility of not acting today, then it's important for us to act in a reasonable way today. Otherwise, uh, we will be acting in a reactive emergency uh, way, which will cost us enormous amounts of money because we'll be forced to do that. And all the developers that look at the Cape as being a desirable place in which to, uh, you know, let's say, in which to develop an opportunity for profit are doing it because of the value that they see on Cape Cod. The value of Cape Cod is based upon the pristine nature of its water and the environment. And the environment does not exist well unless we have a, a continuing clear source of pure water. I tell the kids all the time when they want to teach them great science, I ask them how much water is left? And they all say, well, that must be a trick question. I said, no, all the water in the world is left. It is the management of the water that makes a difference right. as far as its contribution to its, you know, to our, you know, say to the purity and the, you know, the lack of pollution here. Could I just ask, is your report on the website? Yes, it is. And it's on the capekeepers.org website. So the, the um, and, and just to let you know, we came about by picking those people uh, for that review after asking the towns to put forward names. We wanted to keep it to uh, an eight person uh, or was it nine? Yeah, I think whatever it was, it was, it was, it was, seven, it was not, it wasn't it was 15, but nine. I think it was seven, and then Andrew was the, um, chair. the chair, the, the yeah. facilitator, and gave the background and helped guide, you know, gave technical information where they needed it. 
Um, so it was it was uh, you know fairly uh, you know vetted out process. It wasn't like we just said oh, we're going to put these people in the rooms because you know we they were recommended. Yeah, we could have done that. Well, yeah, and we wouldn't have had to have the review. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it, it was pretty clear too, even on Monday night when we talked about this in Falmouth that um, a complete sewering is not the answer for everyone. No, and you don't want not. to do that. No, and some towns may choose to do it. It's over, but it's over the thing. idea is, uh, in certain areas, may require it because of the um, of the denseness of the population, or for or the or the uh, estuaries or embayments. And the um, and the problems that they have in terms of nitrogen loading, but um, um, it, it's interesting. The other point that came up was we're concerned with nitrogen mostly here because we're we have so much shoreline. But um, further um, further in, in inland in the state, their issues are phosphorus. Yeah. And, and that and they're going to be accessing that uh, sewer revolving account as well. And, and those costs are, are very uh, high. That's what I mean. So we have to be aware that we've got to get going, or uh, uh, they'll be they'll be accessing it, and then there won't be any money left for us. So we have to get moving on. And there was a study done. Uh, the collaborative did um, do the funding for it. Put out fifty thousand dollars for the study. And it was focused on the tri towns of Orleans, Brewster, and East Ham. And uh, Mike Geeky did it, and I'm going to ask him to come here and do it for us because it is really uh, a great, great study. And they looked at it from every angle. Uh, what if each town just did it alone? Mm -hmm. What if um, Orleans took the lead, or what if East Ham took the lead, or what if Brewster took the lead? How would it look? How would it reach out? Um, and and the different structures, the different uh, ways you could go. But the result of it all was by regionalizing those three towns, if those three towns would work together and uh, decide to do this, it's a savings of millions and millions of dollars up for each town. Now, it's going to cost millions and millions of dollars, but they will save millions in the process. And, uh, and being able to... Um, have those savings by the regional approach, and then still by being able to to um, excuse me to get the uh, access the zero percent loans, Bill. you're saving more than and you need can to imagine. separate the contracts from the blue folder. Yes, we uh, not to mix them up or run. Um, right. Or Maggie will. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? Uh, this is the folder for the contracts. So let's get in this. <laughs> Um, uh, a gentleman named Michael Giggy is the one that carried it out, but it was the water collaborative that it was the, the Cape, it was our water collaborative that one contracted. One person or some representation needs to talk to the collaborative. Yes. But I think Andrew's busy in them, but we were right. like that. No, okay. no, that was right. just the one night. Yeah. No, he's willing to go yeah. anywhere, anywhere and yeah, everywhere. I mean, that week in Tuesday, you'll be in the lower upper Cape. <laughs> yes. And and we're having ours on Sunday afternoon. I don't know if people don't like give up their weekend. So. No, this Sunday you're having November it's, 14th. No, it's the 14th. No, the 14th. November. Okay. And where about? Somewhere in our we have a Oh, you're going to email us. Okay. Okay. So okay. We okay. just decided on this time. Monday, so we're exploring. We just resolved this show. sort of um, logistical question in our minds. Because the question has been, will Brewster have its meeting yeah. in Chatham and Harwich? But I think clearly they should have their meeting with you guys. Yeah, and this one. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we will extend that. We can tell that to the assembly today that we will extend that comment period another another, another week. week. Shall we vote to do that? I'll, I'll, move, I'll move that. that. Oh, you move that. Okay. So, and I'll second it. Okay. All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. We'll and um, we'll ask. Uh, yeah. yeah, that would be the end of October. I mean, sometimes people will just start cluing in once they they hear uh, it all going on and the period will be over and I would not want to um, uh, make people feel that they didn't have their their voice heard. so that's a good thing um, and I think that's I think it's okay. cool. um, I, I had some comment uh, I'm very happy to report that uh, John Peter took over uh, at his first meeting at the IPA oh yes it went very well but I, 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 I he's reinforced my opinion that uh, 
that he would be uh, reaching out to the community. He's already made some plan and made some what I would call very solid decisions with regard to uh, fiscal accountability and, uh, and changes in schedule, which are more user friendly. So it's all great things happening over there, and uh, I'm looking forward to you know to him to continue to reach out to the rest of the people. And the other other good thing, people for those of us who go to a lot of meetings, the meeting instead of being three hours was only an hour and a half. So. So that there's an improvement right there. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, well, there is one other thing. We're uh, kudos to you, Sheila, for uh, you know for getting the uh, support for uh, the. Uh, I I, uh, I, I sent that out thing. basically. I was I was sent that out basically just not to um not to toot my horn, no, but no, just no, to no, keep no, just no, to no, keep no, you up to date no, when no, they no, said no, it. Don't put up the shields and the compliments. Okay. <laughs> no, it, it, it was very important that we you know that we got the initial support. When I about the governor oh, signing oh, okay. and Kate coming in okay. number yes. two. However, we're in competition with yes, a we couple are. of other ones. The and, uh, I think that we ought, to, you know, we ought to ask Teresa Martin to you know to, to draft up something for us so that we can take this to the next level to follow up because now is not the time to, you know, to let it go. That's only the you know, very first step. Right. Yeah. Well, I happened to mention it to the Senate President the other day, mm -hmm. and they have, her office is very much aware of this, and how important it is to take, and they're right on it. Yes, they are. So, uh, we don't, I think we uh, should feel pretty comfortable with so, mm -hmm. I'm not going to get past the same presence. So. Okay, no, I, I agree. Think you have a lot of anticipatory anxiety. That, uh, right. if, uh, I know. Remember, it's the feds that are giving the money. Right, exactly. The and and I right. think it would be, well, you know, and I did forward it to uh, Mark Forrest's office, and, and he is aware of it, and I had a conversation with him. However, uh, and with the congressman, but um, I, I, you know, you live in Washington, you live in Washington so there's people... That I uh, that I know that have worked in different offices, and if we could just zero in on who is making that final decision out of that uh, technology office, would that be the person that the in Washington wrote a letter to? Well, it's Strickling, Mr. Strickling is the head of it, so that is a, so. How do we? Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Who do we get to him? Right. And that is the one. If we could have a sit down just in front of it, whether you know, just to explain that, or they had that opportunity to present their. Because they, they've done an incredible amount of work in three years. It's been all voluntary. And uh, the, this, we're talking about Open Cape, which is the broadband the broad initiative band. going from one end of the Cape, you know, have, bringing fiber optic down, which would really just create so many more opportunities with education, public safety, economic development. So Maybe we need to make a trip to DC. Yeah, I think that yeah, if we can, if I can zero in on a person and get somebody, I think that's their next. Dan Gallagher. Yeah, get, well, that's yeah, actually I had a conversation with him about this, about going down there. So, but I think it was really worth your while if you know what to do with it. So, yeah. So I know that we're number two, and hopefully there's enough money for at least two of two big projects on in Massachusetts. But if there isn't, wasn't it one per state? Uh, that's, that's what they were saying. So uh, even though we came in number two, the governor, you know, has his uh, love of the Berkshires. Yeah, yeah but yeah, it's, yeah. The NT, it's the NT, NTIA, which is the yes. federal agency that you know that approves it. Right. And they are only prioritizing doing one, at least one per state. So I want to right. make sure yes, that, yeah. that we, can, right. we we could be two. Right. So thank That's you for all this signing. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, it's because we have a lot of contracts with individual nurses to do the, to administer the flu vaccine, so uh, that's what a lot uh, of us is. Uh, this is really pretty much all we have. Uh, uh, okay. Maggie just tripled our work today. Though. Maggie, is there anything uh, you need to tell us? You mean all, all is quiet? Where is uh, himself today, Mr. Zelensky? Uh, Mark is at uh, Macris. Oh, oh, that's right. It's the fall Macris meeting. Right. The spring one was here. Yes, so it's on retirement issues. Part mm -hmm. of retirement issues so. Well, and we do have the assembly. I think if you yes, I do assembly. have at four o'clock. Correct. I, do, I don't think we can adjourn. We're going to recess. Yes, we're going to recess. recess. Yes. So two o'clock recess. Two mm -hmm. o'clock recess, mm -hmm. and we will. And we will reconvene at 2.30. Well, who's going to the four? Four. Uh, four o'clock. Well, well, there's a 2.30 hearing. A two -thirty hearing, hearing and I am going to stop at that for half an hour. So, that you so 2.30. 2.30. Okay. It's just 2 o'clock, and we'll be attending the convening with Assembly of Delegates hearing room. <laughs> there you go. Okay.
right. All right. Is there a motion to? We did. Oh, that's right. That's right. So we're all set. Yeah. And Steve, we're all set, right?